You will get three perspectives of the West Australian journey today. My own from the perspective of a peak organisation that has worked closely to um, collaborate and represent the broad sector interests in the reforms, as well as the perspectives from Rebecca, who's been instrumental from the public sector point of view in leading these reforms from a central agency, and Chris, who's got a wealth of experience in the sector from frontline service delivery in a range of different services. So um, hopefully you'll benefit from all three of those perspectives. Thanks, Irina. Um, as Mark indicated, um, this is really our story um, from Western Australia, and it's a journey that is uh, unfolding and I think unique in, for the context of the West Australian situation. Uh, and we note the topic of this session is could this be the roadmap for Queensland? And I think what we want to do is just get the message across initially that what's actually happened in Western Australia is unique to Western Australia. This is our story and our journey and it may not necessarily be um, totally applicable to your situation here at this present time in Queensland. So I think what we'd encourage you to do is as we go through the presentation is to actually reflect on those aspects of what we talk about um, and how they may or may not be applicable to your particular situation here and we invite you to do that but we do welcome the opportunity to share our story and journey so far. I'd like to say also thank you for the opportunity to come and share our journey. Um, I think like most of uh, every aspect of, of what we've worked on in the last four years, um, certainly this presentation itself is um, a representation of that and it gives us an opportunity to reflect on, on the things that have worked and not worked and I suppose we've got a bit of an overview in terms of giving you some background to um, the partnership forum which has been the, been the sort of overseeing body of these reforms over the last three and a half years, some of the achievements um, what did it take and what did we learn and where to next? And we will endeavour um, throughout all of that to give you a fairly frank and honest insight into to what worked and what didn't. Um, and to be quite frank, I wouldn't expect anything less from my colleagues from the not-for-profit sector to give that frank and honest assessment. But I suppose before we, we head into the presentation, there's probably five key messages from, from certainly the public sector's perspective. One is around it's as much about reform of the public sector as it is about change within the not-for-profit sector. Certainly that is my key learning. Key focus on respecting the roles and responsibilities of each sector and, and the, the roles that people play. It's not about changing those roles and responsibilities, it's about respecting them, working with them and understanding. You've got to maintain focus on the why. Why, you know, in, in any relationship or any method of collaboration or any method of reform or change, keeping focused on the why you came together and what you seek to achieve. And no blame. So very much we came together with an endeavour to, to get a better outcome for the community without actually starting from, you got that wrong, you got that right. You know, if only you'd done something differently, public sector or not-for-profit sector. But the one thing I'd really like to share with you today is, um, for me, this has been the most eye-opening experience over the last four years in my 20-year career in the public sector. I've had an enormous amount of fun. I've met some truly wonderful people um, and been truly inspired by the work that the not-for-profit sector does. And I think that's probably underpinned my journey and, and will endeavour to share that with you today. So um, I thought I'd start by giving a little bit of a picture of what the social landscape had looked like in Western Australia when we embarked on this partnership journey when we had a change of government in 2008. And um, we had had a, a strong and sustained period of economic strength in Western Australia. And there may be some parallels with Queensland in that um, we'd been experiencing a sustained mining boom and that we were looking for, we, we saw a lot of prosperity associated with that for its associated industries. And it drove a lot of population growth in Western Australia where people were attracted to the economic and the employment opportunities associated with that. It drove demand for housing and it drove uh, a lot of cost increases for goods and services. And you could see that in a range of indicators. So WA had indicators that were above national averages on the consumer price index, on the wage price index, on population growth, and on housing prices. So what did that mean for the most disadvantaged and vulnerable, the people that we're here to serve? 
Well, for some, it didn't mean a great deal of difference to their daily lives. They still had to endure similar challenges to what they always had, particularly people who uh, rely on aged care, disability care, uh, care for children. But for others, it did increase the financial pressures and stress that they were under. Um, and what we were starting to see was much more complexity in the need of people who were presenting to community services. So a growing prevalence of mental health issues, of drug and alcohol use, of family violence, of child neglect and abuse, and also an emergence of financial hardship and need in non-traditional consumer bases, uh, working families that couldn't uh, keep up with the costs that were starting to drive into Western Australian community. So I think both sectors, when we came together, were really motivated by a desire to recognise the strengths in Western Australia and to want to find ways to share the prosperity of those economic strengths, to share the benefits of the boom um, throughout. So whilst we acknowledged that there was great pressure on the sector um, and great pressure on the community, there was also great potential to really get some improved outcomes that we hadn't been seeing flow through from the opportunities we had. So, um, Crystal, will talk to you a little bit more about what it meant for the sector, that, that landscape. So, from the um, community sector's perspective, 2007 to 2009 was a particularly challenging year, or a couple of years, particularly in terms of the sustainability of the services um, that were being provided by the um, not-for-profit sector. And I think it's really important that when we talk about sustainability here um, this morning, the focus for all of us was about the sustainability of services to the community. It was far less about the sustainability of individual organisations. So when we talk about that, it's really important to put that in context. We were all experiencing exceptionally high staff turnovers um, and very low staff retention rates, huge vacancy in the sector. A lot of that was related to the mining and uh, resources boom that was going on at the time. And as you would appreciate, most of everybody out of government and out of the community sector, with the community sector being the last on the tier, going into the private sector, uh, into the mining and resources um, sector and getting employment. So we had very significant um, challenges for our workforce. The characteristics of our workforce, though, in general terms, were not too different to many of the other states and territories. We're predominantly uh, female, metropolitan Perth-based, largely part-time, very mobile in nature, and we had at that time, um, and still in some ways, declining lengths of period of, em of employment um, for staff uh, within the sector. And importantly, 89% of staff employed around that time were on an annual staff salary um, of $50,000 or less per year. We also had very significant disparities in the salaries that were being paid to public sector employees for very similar positions and roles that were being um, performed by private sector employees, community sector employees. In that context, there was something like a 32% um, differential in salaries being paid to new social work graduates, for example, that were coming into the community sector. Um, and then when you get up to the top of the um, social work levels, um, it was something like a 57% uh, differential in what people were able to secure by way of salaries in the public sector and what they were actually able to secure in the community We sector. also had particular um, challenges in, in terms of the um, gender uh, pay gap areas. And WA had and still has the widest gender in terms of pay uh, compared to any other state or territory. And that's been a pattern since the uh, 1980s. Uh, and women have been consistently paid um, less than main men by at least 26%. So with a little bit of that background between what Irina uh, has um, indicated and what I've just said, we're in that uh, booming economic period of sustained growth. We had argued for many years, in fact with the previous government over eight consecutive years, for a social dividend return to the community of Western Australia to ad address um, the significant gaps that were occurring between those that were gaining from the resources boom and those that were being left behind. Yeah. 
And we were also arguing for a return on that um, economic boom to the community sector. The pressures were so great, I think, on the sector at that time, it was actually the first time that I knew uh, had experienced in the sector of the sector actually coming together and all different parts of the sector coming together and agreeing on some fundamental goals uh, moving forward. Uh, and I think that was a major achievement um, for us to have reached that uh, point. It was about what we wanted to achieve in terms of peak bodies and employer groups um, within um, Western Australia. Much of the work that we did actually preceded the work um, that was subsequently done by the state government, um, which was around initiating the importance and recognising the importance and the value of the role of the not-for-profit sector, the government's desire um, to shift uh, more of government service, uh, services to the um, not-for-profit sector, its desire to refocus the public sector on the citizens, all of that combined to give us a unique opportunity to further address and progress um, some of our goals. We were at that time facing quite unsustainable um, community sector and importantly unsustainable services um, that were provided to the community of Western Australia. So we actually had some services that were shutting their doors um, or at risk of doing so. And organisations were certainly not sustainable in terms of their asset and capital base. So there was a lot of talk around um, how do we work together as organisations to keep services on the ground to the community. We estimated at that time a shortfall per annum um, in funding to the sector of well in excess of $215 million per annum. It was also um, causing us as employees to provide what we described as unfair and unjust wages to staff working within the community sector. We had inflation running at 15% cumulative difference between what was being applied to the sector over time and the rate of CPI for Perth at that time. So there was a significant differential there. We had a government policy on indexation which had been adopted back in 2004 but had certainly not been applied, um, and had certainly not been applied consistently across government agencies. And we had very confused, unclear um, funding relationships and arrangements right across government um, with all of the sector. We were drowning under red tape, and I think you'd appreciate what that means. Um, and we were seeking to achieve a system of well-governed community sector organisations able to administer funding effectively and to meet their legislative requirements, whilst at the same time trying to deliver um, quality community services. All aims that I think all of us here um, would share. Lastly, we were seeking a much more professional working relationship with government and with government bureaucracy um, in terms of the provision of services to the community of Western Australia. So they were the goals that we set out to achieve. So from a um, West Australian government or public sector perspective, um, very early on in um, Premier Barnett's first term, so in 2008-2009, in, um, he'd already stated his... Uh, acknowledged the role of the not-for-profit sector, the important role that the not-for-profit sector played both in, in community but also in understanding community need and the relationship that the not-for-profit sector had with community built on trust and that government also trusted the not-for-profit sector. So one of the key features of these um, reforms over the last couple of years is, has been certainly the Premier's strong support um, but also the public acknowledgement of the sector. And so. Um, from day one, there was that, you know, context in which we all operated. Not long after Premier Barnett um, was elected, like most um, new governments, they established a uh, economic audit committee, or I think sometimes called Commission of Audit, and something the Commonwealth's also thinking. And ours was um, started out in Western Australia pretty much the same as everyone else's, which was, right, we've got to find ways of making government far more efficient, effective, finding savings, all those sorts of things. And... It was a two-stage report, but certainly the second report was not what people envisaged. It was very much about looking at the role of the public sector and the changing role of the public sector and the need to become more of a 
a, a facilitator type role and focus more on partnerships and collaboration and putting citizens at the centre um, of all policy and service design. So it certainly had a strong focus on designing or delivering services to meet citizens' needs. But the report itself, I think, and the consultation that led into that brought both sectors together around a conversation about what was actually happening. So some of those issues that Chris and Irina had talked about became the focus of that report and started to give some key directions or a bit of a roadmap to what needed to happen next. So we had not only a state government or premier commitment, but a bit of a roadmap to bring everyone together. And one of the um, key ob um, observations, certainly from from my time both in, in Premier's Department and in Treasury Department was that, you know, during this period of, of boom in Western Australia, a lot of money had gone into human and community services, a lot of growth over a period of, of five to eight years. But it was fairly clear we weren't seeing the same increase in outcomes for the Western Australian community. So there was this sort of glaring moment where everyone from both sectors went, Something's not really working. We're just not getting the improvement in outcomes for that increase in funding. So there was almost like this penny dropped moment where people in the public sector in particular realised, well, we've obviously not got all the answers. So whatever we've been trying has not been working. And I think it was this point at which not only the Premier's acknowledgement of the role of the not-for-profit sector, but very senior people in the public sector started to realise you know, we're not the experts. We don't have the answers. We need to figure out who we need to be working with far more effectively in that whole spectrum from policy through to service delivery and meeting citizens' needs on the ground. So there was this very clear upfront recognition about that broader expertise in the not-for-profit sector and certainly some of the key players who'd been involved in, in many areas for many years had an enormous wealth of expertise from their, from their policy thinking through to their real service design and, and service delivery. And it was also about recognising that we needed to move away from a very siloed approach to policy, planning, design and delivery and, and actually talking to the people who are actually in the business of delivering these services right at the beginning of that process. Because obviously whatever policy advice the public sector was providing was not translating to good outcomes. So we had to start that shift in process. What did that mean? So post the Economic Audit Committee report, which had a, a, a series of, of recommendations, one of the key things that the Premier did in early 2010 was to establish the Partnership Forum. So the Partnership Forum itself, which um, we've had many iterations in Western Australia before, as, as I suspect other jurisdictions have. Comprised of 18 members from the public and community sector. Inaugural chair was Professor Peter Shergold. Had both experience as a member of our Economic Audit Committee report or, or committee itself, had some understanding around what had been happening in Western Australia, had built some important relationships, but also reflected on his experience as a, a long-term Commonwealth public the servant. forum meets regularly, um, and we, it meets on a quarterly basis, but I have to say, between those meetings, there's a whole range of other work that gets done. There's a whole range of other supporting working groups. Reporting to the Premier um, every six months, but also that critical point about reporting to the Premier um, and he's attended on a couple of occasions, particularly at some of the key milestones, has been critical in kind of driving that cross-public sector. The membership of the Partnership Forum was established somewhat differently to attempts we'd made to do this in the past, in that um, where in the past you may have had government look around the community sector and say, who are the leaders, who do we want to appoint? In this process, um, we had central agencies come together with peak organisations and say, who are the right skilled representatives that we need? So the sector was asked to think creatively itself about which representatives we wanted at the table. It wasn't just government appointing people. And that was a, a real clear distinction in terms of process and another signal of wanting to work collaboratively rather than government kind of impose any reform direction. Um, the other thing was the sector was also asked for advice and input on which public sector agencies needed to be at the forum as well. I think there was something like 16 different public sector agencies that contracted with the not-for-profit sector. We obviously couldn't have all of them at the table, but we expressed a view that we thought it was equally important to have central agencies involved like Treasury and Premiers, not just the line agencies responsible for the service delivery. 
Um, we also tried to balance that this wasn't just about being representatives and having a right mix of services represented, although we did end up with a, a fair degree of coverage from mental health, aged care, ch uh, children protection services and so on, um, but that, that it was about having the right skills of the individuals and that once appointed the individuals were there in their own right. Um, it didn't all go swimmingly, and we'll talk about lessons learned a little later, but um, it did signal a real shift in that the, uh, the membership, the sector did have input and control over the, the, its own representatives. So I think one of the critical um, factors in this was having an independent chair. So somebody that neither came from government or came from the community sector. And I think it was the first real indication that we were seriously moving into a a collaborative relationship on somewhat equal terms. Arrangements were made um, certainly by the community sector representatives and I was one of those to meet with Peter Shergol as that independent chair um, on several occasions to brief Peter about what our perspective was on things from the community sector side. Critically, there were some really important qualities that Peter brought to the situation that we had, in addition to the ones that Rebecca has already mentioned in terms of his knowledge of what he had gained through the, uh, his participation on the Economic Audit Committee itself. Um, but he always made himself available to listen and to learn from us and to really get a deep understanding of what the ongoing issues um, had been for the community sector. So he acted very much as that independent and what I call an honest broker. Whilst appointed by Premier and Cabinet at the end of the day, he acted very much with integrity and transparency in his dealings, not only in meetings um, of the partnership forum, but outside of those. He's in, as Rebecca's indicated, he brought a deep understanding of um, the political and bureaucratic machinery of government, which really helped, but also a deep respect for the not-for-profit sector. And a willingness and a capacity, I think, to allow robust, very robust, um, debate and discussion at times uh, about a whole raft of issues, but in such a way that it was done and the rules were set about um, that that would be done in respectful ways. As we move forward, we're looking to Peter's term is, um, has finished uh, and we're looking at the present time to the appointment of somebody that would bring similar sorts of qualities to take us through um, the next stage of our development. Objectives of the Partnership Forum, I suppose, um, without going through them, the key things to kind of note from that, and this is the sort of the upfront objectives of the forum and the journey sort of has evolved since then, but. Those objectives were developed jointly, so that was critical. It wasn't the public sector said, well, this is what we're going to do, now come to the table. It was a, a joint conversation around what would they be. The sequencing was critical. So, um, you know, we could have started with, um, you know, let's look at um, person-centred approaches for the next two years, but it was more about the conversation about what is the sequencing of actually building this relationship and focusing on improved outcomes. What are the things we need to do collectively together and in what order? So that was pretty critical. And capacity building. There was a, a recognition, I think, from day one that for this to work, there needed to be a pretty honest discussion about capacity building in both sectors. And implementation. We all reflect upon some of the Commonwealth Government's um, reforms in the last whatever years and, and the importance of you know, thinking through implementation. I think state governments have had the same reflection in, in the last couple of years, and certainly that was one of our thoughts through this process. But to give you the frank and honest sort of assessment of this, when we started this, certainly from a public sector perspective, what I found um, interesting was whenever I'd front a forum of the, of the community sector or of both sectors, I had this sort of key observation, which was after being hounded with numerous questions by the not-for-profit sector for, for many months, and they were really hard ones and they were really in-your-face type questions, there's a real sense of advocacy and passion in the sector that I came to appreciate, which I often contrasted, dare I say it, with the apathy in the public sector where I got very little question. And that probably from day one has been, how do you actually deal with that apathy in the public sector for change? But a lot of scepticism in the not-for-profit sector. I, I probably did underestimate that, you know, I was fresh to this, whoa, let's have some reform and some change. And people are going, yep, well, we've been here for the fifth time now in 20 years. So what do you know and what, why is it going to be different this time? So, uh, you know, there was an enormous amount of scepticism and 
particularly where you've had that sort of contracting power imbalance for many years where, you know, well, okay, well, we're partners, well, that's nice in words, now tell me what it actually means in behaviours. And so that, that, that scepticism was, you know, was fairly You know, I think from my own personal perspective, if I'd come in and known the level of scepticism and the, the level of how hard this would be from the previous attempts, you know, I probably would have even myself thought, mm, maybe this is just a bit too hard. So it probably helped to be a little bit naive and not to know too much about the not-for-profit sector and have too much history with the sector and believe, well, these, this can be done. I think there was a, an element of naivety made me think, well, this just could be possible. But, <laughs> but I had wonderful I support. I cannot tell you that the people that, you know, I worked very closely with in the not-for-profit sector that helped me get out in the sector, meet some of the key people, um, and that didn't mean the peak key the people that ran the big organisations, it was a whole range of people and, and shepherded me through some of those difficult conversations. Just remarkable. It was just um, the things that I it learned. It took about 18 months to get to the Partnership Forum Directions document. The only points I wanted to really make about that, that diagram, um, which kind of became the sort of map of what was going on in 2012, was the mission is at the top. So it was always about coming back to the why the how we were going to do it, which is the principles and behaviours and how they would guide everything. So it's not just we were, used the principles and behaviours on the funding and contracting reform, but when we did something else, we just went back to the way we were. And this was more about the public sector um, and, and driving that change. But it's also about how it hangs together. So what has been critical in our experience is going to drive a, a relationship-based reform with a more professional and mature approach to contracting and a whole range of things, then you've got to be consistent. And I suppose yes. being too critical, that would be the, the direct comparison we would make with the Commonwealth reforms where, you know, there, there's been sort of a, a divergence of what those reforms look like. So you've got the Office of the Not-for-Profit Sector doing one thing, quite different from what Federal Treasury is doing, particularly in the tax, and then into the ACN reforms and through to the contracting reforms. What the message we heard and the, the, the key driving thing that we've tried to achieve in all of these reforms is be consistent and make people be consistent. So having a fairly strong accountability to those principles, behaviours, and actually linking that if you're going to reduce the administrative burden through your contract, and then don't just add another layer over here, you have to be focused on that. And the point about the mission and focusing on why is that things will get hard um, and it's very easy for people to just go back to their corners and go back to the way that they've done things and they've always done them. And again, probably the, the lesson for the public sector is that, you know, that is the easy way out and getting everyone to remain focused on the why is critical. I'll just give you the shorthand version of what those principles and behaviours actually are. If you can't read the mission there, it says to improve outcomes for all Western Australians through a genu genuine partnership in the policy, planning and delivery of community services in WA. And that's quite important because it means you can't drop the ball at any stage. You have to be committed for the longer term throughout the delivery and maintain that kind of partnership approach as you go on. And so um, we did put, with the uh, wisdom of experience of many others who'd been in the sector for a long time, the um, somewhat uh, sceptical, but also based on experience wise, question to government of, well, what are the behaviours that will model the principles? Um, when you talk about improving outcomes, we need to have a commitment to actually measure them and to be able to demonstrate them and whether or not the things that we're working on together are making a difference and if not, to change direction. When you talk about the principle of a collaborative approach, we need to see the evidence of the consultation and the engagement in how you're making decisions in your behaviours. Um, there was a principle about respect and trust and that that has to be mutual and it has to be for each of the sectors. So the community sector had to do some learning about the public sector as well and respect um, and trust the, um, the, the behaviours in, in, the, in each other. That meant there needed to be information sharing, there needed to be transparency, there needed to be evidence and shared data, um, evidence and transparency around funding arrangements as well. The fourth principle, the recognition of the roles of each of us and the behaviour we wanted to see there is about the interdependence again at all stages, the policy, the planning, the delivery of services. 
a principle around sustainability of services and an ongoing and enduring commitment to that meant we needed to see a behaviour that the funding levels are sufficient to be able to sustain those services. And finally, the final principle around the empowerment of people who use services in the community meant we needed to have a commitment to engage the citizens, engage the consumers and the carers and the broader stakeholders out there. So, um, how's that been going? Well, to be honest, we didn't spend an awful lot of time and effort on this because um, we'd been through this several times before. We had the experience at the national level of the compact and we've had other similar kind of policy frameworks before where awful amounts of time and money and energy have gone into developing these things that haven't really meant much at the end of the day. So we wanted something very practical to guide what we do, not what just we say is important. Um, and we put this together within the first two meetings of the partnership forum and moved on. We've reflected back on them from now and from time to time to make sure that they still um, hold true. Uh, we hold each other to account when there's signs that we're not working in the spirit of the principles and behaviours. Uh, but we also understand that sometimes there's financial realities or political constraints, but we call them out, we name them, and we try to find ways to, to work forward around them. The final point I want to make about these was that, and it is up there on the slide, to give credit to people like Rebecca and others who are leaders in public sector central agencies for their role in modelling these principles and these behaviours. And there are other leaders in the public sector who've been doing that modelling as well, but it's been really critical to get that cultural change ball rolling, um, that there is a different approach now, um, and to, to try to um, lead that through the, the public sector as well as others in the community sector as well. But the central agencies have been really critical to embedding these principles and behaviours. I'd get complaints probably every week about public sector agencies not doing things the way they should be doing. Sometimes it's just because people aren't, you know, haven't been really immersed in these reforms and are new to it. Um, some of it's just clunky language misunderstanding and some of it's deliberate behaviours. So, you know, I think what has changed is, changed is there is a much more broader awareness of the way the public sector is required to behave and there's a much more transparent accountability around it. The principle about sustainable services and sufficient funding, it was really critical to us. Rebecca talked about the importance of getting the sequencing right and we made no secret of that being the first priority of the community sector in this space. In order to deal with sustainability, we needed to deal with the sustainability of the services on the ground to the community of Western Australia before we would engage in partnership. I think that would be the bottom line and we hold that line initially through very robust discussions. Unless there was a genuine fix of the funding arrangements and some of the contractual arrangements that were going on, um, for government to talk to us and to try and enter into a partnership arrangement with us um, would have just been more the rhetoric that we had heard for decades previously. And in fact, I think we made that very clear in the early discussions. The partnership um, forum itself provided the avenue to enable us to acknowledge the historical funding shortfall to the sector state funded community services and that that was a critical issue that needed to be addressed. And that was important, as I said, because we'd heard so often, as you probably do, um, all the rhetoric around the fact that we're really important and that we're really valued and we're essential part of the community services network, provision to the community, etc. Bottom line is put the money where your mouth is and let's get on with it. Doing that, the Partnership Forum set up a joint um, public and community sector working group and we set out to achieve a number of things that are on the screen there. One was a shared understanding of the historical funding issues impacting on the community sector, an understanding of the, fa of the um, factors which had contributed to that situation, for example, decades of inadequate indexation funding. What could be done to address these factors and importantly, we began to look at what we needed to do to prevent them recurring in the future and then quantifying the shortfall, which was a very challenging process and task to do but that. We did, in fact, um, do some work in surveying about 18 different organisations, which opened up 
took a level of trust by those organisations to open up their books to independent people to actually have a look at um, what was happening on the ground in terms of funding. From there, the Partnership Forum provided its advice to the Premier. And I think what's important to note is that there were certain aspects of that advice that the community sector was still sceptical about and still had concerns about. And the independent chair, Peter Shergold, agreed that the community sector's um, concerns would also be put up at the same time as the Partnership Forum. But there was a, re a recognition of the reality that it was actually the Premier and Cabinet um, that were going to make the decision at the end of the day. That was the reality of the political situation that we were in. Just before I touch on procurement reform, the, the whole review of community sector funding, I think, um, was an important piece of work for two reasons, both because of the analysis that it provided in supporting advice to the partnership forum and, and relationships and, and actually building trust and respect and understanding the role of each sector. A lot was achieved in that process. It was painful, don't get me wrong. I can remember a few moments where I thought, uh-oh, this isn't going very well. I'm not sure how we're gonna navigate this. But um, the way I described it was, it was such an emotive issue uh, for the community sector that the people that were involved were really good at actually putting emotions to one side and let's talk about the data and the analysis and that's what got us through. And that, I think, was the lesson in trying to navigate some of those really difficult issues. If you can put emotions to one side and work through the facts, you can then bring the emotions back and they were back at the end, make no mistake, the whole advocacy was still there and still alive and well, but it was getting through that process, which actually... Um, I think a lot was achieved in there was a moment when the Premier and, and the Cabinet said, yep, there is a shortfall. Now let's talk about how much it is and the, the analysis was there. In parallel, there was a really important process running around procurement reform. Um, again, done jointly with the, um, the community sector and people who'd been involved in um, procurement reform attempts in the past. Um, their goodwill came back to the table to talk about you know, what is the next step? How do we build that mature relationship? And largely about how do we address some of the implementation failures of the past? So it wasn't about starting from scratch. It was saying, well, we actually had a, a go at this 10 years earlier, or some of it just wasn't being implemented properly. And so it was about learning on how you actually implement that, how you mature the relationship, how you reduce the administrative burden, how you move to sustainable pricing, which was the link back into the funding work, and how you, you harness that broader expertise and how you actually make it stick, how you build the capacity, how you build uh, a really a detailed implementation approach and how you, how you have accountability so that in four to five years, you can actually go, well, yep, we have made the necessary changes rather than in four to five years going, well, that was all really nice and well and that document's really lovely and sits on a shelf, but nobody actually adheres to it. So it was really about how do you make it work. But also, I think the fundamental step forward was, and in that discussion, how do you place service uh, users at the centre of design, planning and delivery? And that was probably the other critical step um, forward. If we start to move to look at some of the achievements to date, um, I think there were three critical ones from our perspective in terms of government's a genuine acknowledgement of the um, community sector. So one was a true recognition of the importance of the role of the community services sector in Western Australia. The second, I think, was a, around a recognition of both the independence of the sector, and that played out in a whole lot of different ways, but also the interdependence between government and the community sector, um, which was a really important dynamic and balance that was um, going on. There was the development development in that context of quite a mature relationship over time. Um, we've still got a long way to go, but we're well and truly on the road. And the third was ensuring the future sustainability of the services provided by the community sector and taking some very meaningful steps put in terms of the funding um, that Irina will talk about um, and some of the changes to the contractual arrangements. From our perspective, the achievements have been really significant. Even just this first one that you can see here about upholding the partnership principles was a real sign of that changing relationship becoming evident in the early stages of this new relationship. 
Um, the work that Chris talked about having been done, the commitment to actually undertake the review, was probably the first time you would have seen very senior leaders in the sector and a public sector get right down into the detail of what the problems were and come up with some solutions to that through that review um, in terms of funding. So that was an achievement in and of itself to have that review undertaken. And thirdly, the procurement reform resulted in a new whole of government policy that wasn't just a policy, but implemented a new unit within the Department of Finance so that we didn't drop the ball at the point of implementation, as Rebecca was talking about. So we set up a funding and contracting services unit to oversee and mandate the implementation of that policy for the longer term, the delivering community services in partnership policy. And also, we had put in place, through the Partnership Forum, a governance framework to oversee that implementation and, and uh, across both funding, mm. contracting and the behaviours. What was unique about this was the genuine effort to embed this approach, um, to embed the decisions to make sure that that was um, focus continued, that it wasn't just about setting up the policy and then implementing it, but it was also about trying to drive cultural change, that this is about an ongoing approach to be working more collaboratively and in partnership across the sectors. What came out of it was quite remarkable. Within only 12 months of the first meeting of the Partnership Forum, um, which was announced in April 2010, I think had its first meeting in July, and then by May 2011, we had an unprecedented and historic state budget, which included as its key feature a $1 billion social service package. That was quite astonishing. Um, the key feature of the package was a $604 million sustainable funding initiative for the community services sector, which was to be implemented over five years. It comprised of a 25% funding increase that was worth $491 million uh, to eligible service agreements, and Rebecca will talk a little bit more about the, uh, the processes associated with that, as well as $96 million to fund a mandated continuation of an indexation policy. And critically, again, to the implementation was this $18 million to support um, both government agencies across the public sector as well as the not-for-profit sector. A really amazing achievement particularly the scale of the result, but also the speed with which we kind of got this result on the table. When the Premier met with the forum uh, the week that the funding was announced, the 604 million, my expectation, he was going to go in there and pat everyone on the back and go, well, what a great job you've all done. Thanks very much for coming. Um, what he actually said was, this is a big investment in the sector and I expect you both to make sure the returns for community are delivered. And I was a bit like, oh, that's a big expectation, but that's the reality of this. It was a large sum of money, but there is an onus on everybody involved from both sectors, and not just in the partnership form, but more generally, to ensure that it delivers better outcomes for the West Australian community. What's important about the funding adjustment was that it was consistent with the procurement reform. So it was about paying a fair and appropriate price. So that funding flew, flowed through a price adjustment. It didn't flow through some commitment to increased salaries in relation to industrial agreements of which the state government's not a party to. It was about being consistent with the procurement reforms. There was a long discussion about how the money would flow. Um, and I'm happy to talk to people about that at lunchtime, about how that discussion went. But essentially, there was an upfront injection and that recognised in Western Australia there had been significant consequences in terms of the workforce of the not-for-profit sector from those boom times. And so the upfront was about the sustainability of services and the sustainability of, of, of the workforce. And that flowed to 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 contracts. Um, this was critical for two reasons, not just the sustainability of services, but to show the public sector that the government was serious about doing this and making it happen quickly was about, this is not gonna go away. These are important reforms and we're gonna drive it hard. The second tranche of funding, the 10% is linked to reform. And also remaining sustainability issues. So probably similar to Queensland, issues around regional and remote, historical underfunding, whole range of issues which had arisen from you know, poor contracting practices in the public sector over time. Um, just picking up then, the Delivering Community Services in Partnership Policy, which is the sort of the broad procurement it's pretty much sets out the rules for engagement 
not just in the way that we contract, but the way we work from policy through to um, the choice of whether it's a funding arrangement to a grant. But I suppose the most critical point I'd pick out is the next slide, which is a diagram, and this goes back to the consistency. The whole policy itself is shaped around the principles and behaviours that the Partnership Forum established that Irena talked about. And this diagram was sweated over both in its um, conception but also in the accountability for it. And it pretty much guides all of our work going forward. I think one of the things that we've learnt in this process is getting clarity around what's a service agreement and what's a grant and what's the right reporting uh, requirements and relationship about that is fundamental to underpinning the relationship going forward. And so it's taken probably the state five years to figure out clearly what that is. So we now know for each of our 15 government departments involved in these reforms, what's a service agreement and what's a grant. That is key to reducing the administrative burden, but also understanding the relationship. And it's also about recognising that the policy itself will be the thing that makes the long lasting change. Took probably 12 months to develop, it'll take 10 years to really, really implement. And I think that's the learn, learning in this, is that some of these reforms take time, um, not just because they're about relationships, but they're about cultural change. The other thing that we think is really important in this policy is your government not just determining unilaterally what services it wants to fund and putting them out to tender, but that through the relationship we decide together what are the important community outcomes we are trying to achieve, what does the evidence tell us about the needs analysis for the services, and then what's the appropriate strategic response. And it's at that stage where we work together on co-designing services before you even get to a contracting or funding stage. So what did it take? Well, we've talked about the key focus of the reforms to both of the sectors, and that's been really critical. To have that broad engagement and consultation across both of the sectors, there was a spaghetti map diagram of all of the working groups and steering groups and committees that sat underneath and supported the partnership forum as it was being established. We used every acronym you could imagine through <laughs> this process. It was astonishing. Um, but it did mean that we built a lot of buy-in across the sector from a lot of people in both the public services, uh, public sector agencies and community services that helped to shape the policies as they were being developed, that helped to contribute towards the reviews and writing all of the documents documents that fed up through the chain and ultimately influenced the decisions that were being made by Premier and Cabinet. And what I mean that, I don't mean the department, I mean the decisions that actually went to the Premier and were made by our elected Cabinet. Um, another thing that was really important to achieving this was actually doing the work, the hard work on the ground to build the capacity to understand and to implement. So there's been a huge investment in capacity building in both sectors on the ground. There's been training rolled out across the state into regional areas. There's been fact sheets and frequently asked questions and webinars and workshops, one-to-one -one peer learning groups, all of it, to, so that we could keep people involved and engaged and learning about what is the difference that we're trying to implement here, what does it take, how do we do it, what are we learning as we go. Clear and succinct communication, so we have communiques coming out of every partnership forum and we also try to put on a, a broad community engagement event um, alongside either before or after each partnership forum meeting, which has just got the 20 odd people in the room. We have about 200 or 300 people from the sector rocking up to these forums every time the partnership forum has a meeting. So so that kind of engagement has been really important. But at the end of the day, it's been about coming back to the goal. It's been about coming back to that mission, reminding ourselves why we're all here, and that the focus has been about the outcomes. The focus hasn't been about, well, we've got a job to do and it's about reform. It's about, no, we've got a change to make. It's about a new way of working to actually achieve the outcome. One of the things that can't be understated is the, the leadership the commitment that we got from the Premier in WA who believed in this, and Rebecca's talked about this already, that has been really critical to making this work, and I guess to, to giving the mandate across the public sector. The genuine commitment to building the relationships, the time that so many different people have invested in this, and that many of those people have stayed at the table has been really helpful. So the people at senior levels in Treasury, in Premiers, in Finance, and in other agencies who started this process back in 2008, many of them are still involved, so you're not losing that knowledge and expertise.
Um, the central agency coordination and support. We've done secondments between um, the community sector and public sector agencies throughout this process. A lot of those things have helped as well. But also, at the end of the day, a lot of this did come down to a little bit of luck, a little bit of chance, and the stars aligning. We had the political will. We had the economic conditions that meant the government had the capacity to do something about this. We had passion that emerged in some key people like Rebecca in the public sector who were prepared to drive it. Um, and we had the community sector work more collaboratively than it had in a long time. So all of those things collectively meant that we had a really good opportunity for success. We've talked a little bit about the focus, remaining focused on the why, and that, that's pretty much common sense. Um, probably some of the other things we learnt along the way was um, you know, there was really good willingness in this. I think despite all that scepticism, I think everyone came to the table thinking, you know, maybe maybe we could make it happen this time. But genuine collaboration takes time. It isn't easy. There were some really difficult moments. There still are. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're moving into that discussion where, you know, the, the, the prosperous economic times um, no longer exist in our state either. Um, and the challenges, you know, are, are really what does partnership look like in difficult times? And, and we're going into and that. I suppose I've talked about, you know, when I started this work, it was like, well, yep, three years. And then I think as I got 12 months in, went, well, no, it's just going to take a little bit longer than that. Um, and now it's, no, actually, it's going to take 10 years. And I think it is, you know, building genuine collaboration does take time. We, we had quite a um, collaborative approach to disability services in our state, and that's taken 25 years. So... That kind of was the context. Listening, don't ever underestimate the you know importance of listening. And I think that has been a mindset shift for public servants who naturally assume that they are meant to have the answers, but in fact, maybe if they just listened for a while, um, that might assist. And, and that even, you know, I had to retrain myself. Um, keeping stakeholders engaged and informed. We talked a little bit about broader in the community sector, but from, from our perspective, stakeholders meant making sure the Premier and his office were kept up to date on what was happening. Um, some of the other ministers and ministers' offices and, and some of the other key players on a journey so significant as this, making sure people understand where things are at, where are opportunities, because it isn't just about the, the work of the partnership forum. Where this really plays out is when we get into the other policy issues. So, you know, the way in which we're reforming the approach to mental health services, policy planning and delivery in the state, um, in an aged care and other places. So looking for those opportunities and connections is important and, and working with stakeholders to, to find those is critical. Being flexible and responsive, um, I think that was something that... There were moments of great nervousness, particularly in the early stages around the funding and contracting about, you know, will government make certain decisions or not? And we had to be... Um, a little bit out there and I suppose, you know, we spent four months of doing the implementation planning around the funding and contracting reforms without any decisions of Cabinet that they were going to commit that level of funding and I think um, that was certainly a little, uh, a moment of nervousness for us but I think it, it you know, it, it paid off in actually building a sound business case to Government that this could actually be achieved and implemented. You know, we've learned this process about how to respect the role of advocacy. And I think my boss is always the first to say that, you know, the day the not-for-profit sector members turn up and start to agree with everything the public sector is saying is the day we can pack up and go home. We'll be wasting our time. So, you know, we've had incredibly um, honest discussions and I think, um, Chris has been a great uh, demonstrator of that. You know, I think pushing back on the usual sort of rhetoric and arguments of public sector is important. Don't be afraid to name the elephants. I think everyone likes to sort of pretend they don't exist and dance around them. But the reality is this won't work until you name the elephants. Talk about them, analyse them, find a way forward. You're still respectful of roles and responsibilities. But, you know, there is that importance of understanding the, you know, the important role of advocacy. And on the flip side of that, I think the learning for the public sector is around probity. Um, well, no, we can't talk to people. You know, we've got rules and regulations and things that we can and can't do. What if we risk this and we risk that? And I think the learning is we're all pretty clear on what's the role and responsibility of government. That doesn't change very much. They're accountable to their electorate. public servants are pretty good at hiding behind that. They're pretty good at hiding behind probity. 
There are ways around this. There are ways in which you can actually engage upfront in the policy and design process without compromising the procurement process. It's not impossible. The reality is if we don't do things a little bit differently, then we're kidding ourselves about who bears the risk because the reality is the community bears the risk and that was the realisation we came So getting to. past that conversation around procurement, conflict of interests, probity, is not impossible. It, it, it can be navigated, risk can be managed and conflicts can be managed. And we're still facing that challenge on a regular basis. I mean, risk is one of the big difficulties we have engaging with public sector agencies in embedding this cultural reform. You know, the fear of run, ending up on the front page of the West if you get some micro issue in a contract wrong is sometimes more front of mind than the societal risk of not achieving the outcome for people who are vulnerable or disadvantaged because you don't um, respect or engage the people who've got the advice and the expertise to, to give it. So um, we're still not there yet. Um, we've got a long way to go. Um, the challenges and opportunities continue. We are, I think, still working through what it means to be working in partnership and some of us don't even like the word partnership. Um, so you would have seen that we intertwine their partnership with collaboration because the imbalance of power just simply around funding that Rebecca's referred to comes into play at, at various points. We're still grappling with what um, partnership means beyond the traditional service procurement and funding relationship. So in other words, what does that mean in terms of joint policy? development, what does it mean in terms of joint identification of community need, what does it mean in terms of joint planning, joint design of services to the community and joint service delivery. Some of the critical questions, how do we jointly navigate our way through the current federal government reform objectives and processes and we're trying to work our way through that in Western Australia at the moment, particularly given the experience that we've had in Western Australia around this partnership arrangement. And that's been a very different experience so far for us in Western Australia to what we have experienced with the federal government reforms to date. How do we manage the partnership in, t in a tightening fiscal environment, which is exactly what we're moving into, similar to yourselves, I think. How do we minim meaningfully support local collaboration within and between government and the community sector and with our consumer base? And how do we better utilise and share all of the data that we've collected, which you'd be familiar with. We collect it all, it goes into a black hole somewhere, and we're now trying to look at what's actually useful in that and what are we going to do and with do it. we need it in the first place? So for us, our journey continues to take shape and our story continues to unfold. And if all of this is ultimately in the best interests of the people that we are here for, um, then I think you would agree that achieving better quality of outcomes uh, and better services to achieve those better quality of outcomes is what we're all on about. Have we got it all right? No. Have we finished the journey? No. Um, but do we have an obligation to continue to work together? I think if you spoke to everybody in Western Australia at the present time involved in this process, yes, and there's a deepening commitment to getting it right.